Hello everyone and welcome today to today's webinar. My name is Olga Bodie and I'm a Syngap parent and volunteer part of the team at uh, Syngap Research Fund. Our presentation today is on severe behaviors and advocacy. And I have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jackie Cancer. Jackie is the parent to 18 year old Jaden who has Syngap 1. And Jackie's also the elder sibling of an individual with disabilities. And in high school, she founded an organization to promote integration of disabled students with their neurotypical peers. Jackie started blogging in 2008, and her background includes IEP advocacy for families of children with disabilities. She's been developmental director for a 501c3 veterans program, advocacy focus on crisis care. She's a committee member on national Council on Severe Autism Policy, and she's a scholar of partners in policymaking by Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities. <coughs> Jackie is also the editor of What We Need Yesterday, which can be accessed via Facebook. A recorded version of this webinar will be available on the Syngap Research Fund website under webinars, which is on the family menu. By the end of this presentation, you will have the opportunity to get to answer your questions. We'd love to hear from you. So please write your question in the Q&A below. For those of you just joining us, welcome. And again, our speaker is Jackie Cancer and her presentation today is on severe behaviors and advocacy. Jackie, it's now my pleasure to turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Olga. And thank you to the Syngap Research Fund for hosting this webinar today because this information uh, is something that just really isn't out there. So I'm really excited to get it out there for you. Um, it's my hope that this really gives some of the parents that may be experiencing this or going to experience this a, a pathway and a guide that I did not have when we first started into it. And also that maybe it sparked some interest in providers and researchers and legislators to help resolve some of the gaps that we currently have in the system. So I have a lot of, to cover today. And so I'm just gonna get right to get started. So as we get through this um, presentation, let me put that back up. As we go through the presentation, let me show you, we have some icons here, if you see them, you see the paper, that just means that there'll be a resource provided if you wanna dig into it further. We don't have time to dive as far into that today. There is the green button is where you would have an opportunity to advocate on a particular topic. And then the gavel is something to pay attention to regarding your rights. So let's talk about severe behaviors in SYNGAP1, what the etiology really is of these behaviors. SYNGAP is uh, regulates signaling in neurons and it actually serves as a mediate, mediator of synaptic plasticity. And so as you see over here, when we're talking about synaptic plasticity, this is kind of the roadmap of that, you have your synapse, your neuron, your neuronal circuitry, and then behavior. When synaptic plasticity becomes dysregulated, that results in pathological behaviors. This image is one that I've actually shared with some of Jaden's providers so that they really get an understanding of what is going on in her brain. And on the left here, we have our neurons, normal neurons that are very clear and crisp so that we can flow that information through and learn. And then on the right is Syngap neurons. And this image is actually by Dr. Rick Huguenier, and he is the director of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins, but he's also the chair of the SRF Scientific Advisory Board. And he um, did a webinar for us as well, and I'll provide his link to that if you'd like to dive into that. So when we're talking about synaptic dysregulation, this is how I, kind of break it down for um, the non-medical side of things so that we can kind of understand what's going on with SYNGAP1. And that results in sensory dysregulation. And so I'm thinking of like when you 
have a traffic light out, which is very similar for our Syngapians, then all this kind of chaos is, is assumes. And we have the one guy that's just going off into a tangent, into a different lane and trying to push other people out. That's sensory dysregulation. You have the car there that is just sitting and overheating and steaming. We get emotional dysregulation. We all know that guy that just decides to use the emergency lane to speed on by and that would be seizures. And then the one that decides to take a different path and just ends up with his wheels being stuck in the mud. And that would be perseverations. And perseverations are something that has become a real trigger for us, uh, for behaviors. And it's just uh, obsessive thoughts, very extreme obsessive thoughts. And so that would be something if you're seeing, I would really recommend getting with a developmental behaviorist uh, to look into the possibility that severe behaviors may be coming down the road. And this is the video by Dr. Rick Huguener that the Syngap Research Fund did. And so if you'd like to get more information on that, you can see that there. Emotional dysregulation is really, a lot of it is stems from, again, that, that difficulty with learning, not really even being able to distinguish the difference between being disappointed and being mad. So there is a lot of lack of awareness of what moods and emotions even are. Of course, we have a very difficult time learning adaptive strategies. So this makes it um, difficult to engage in goal-directed behaviors. Additionally, other involuntary symptoms we have, of course, we know that our kids have uh, a difficulty filtering sensory information and uh, that there is your sensory dysregulation. We have communication language disorders and a decreased sensitivity to pain, which actually becomes pretty dangerous. And notice I said involuntary, and this is your first kind of, first time we see the advocacy icon here. And this is really important because when you're advocating, it's really important to develop your narrative. And we really need to try to destigmatize severe behaviors. It's not that severe behaviors are new. Severe behaviors have spanned across developmental disabilities for as long as we've been tracking. And the problem is that they are often treated um, with this stigma as if they're not uh, a medical symptom, which as we just see, they absolutely are. And these are episodic medical events. Notice that I don't call them tantrums or meltdowns, which I have no judgment how anybody chooses to use the language to describe their story in any kind of way. But personally, I choose to use the word episode to further grind in that this is a medical event and we understand episodic medical events like seizures and that we need to track their intensity and their duration and their frequency. And when we're talking about severe behaviors, we need to do this very same thing if we're gonna get accurate data. Involuntary means a lot of things and it means that there's no reason for shame in this. This is not a reflection of your child's character in any way. If this comes to pass, uh, it's not a moral defect or a parenting defect. And it, it means, you know, if your grumpy Uncle Joe told you, you just need to get the paddle out or that you're not being a disciplinarian enough, you can send him the video and show him that image from Dr. Rick Huguenier and show that none of those things are going to work, that this is something that needs intensive, specialized medical treatment. Severe behavior episodes also are not a criminal offense or a domestic call. So they are a medical event that requires emergency medical response. The law, because this is a medical event, protects our children from discrimination and disability. And this means also from Medicaid administrators. And, you know, I've heard things like from particular MCO directors and, and employees of perhaps we should really take out the behaviors of her person-centered support plan because it's going to be really difficult to find anybody to want to take that case. And 
Uh, that in and of itself is a discrimination. We would never say that to somebody who had cerebral palsy or another condition that we have become more familiar with. It does kind of bring me reminiscent back into, uh, I'm dating myself, but I'm old enough to remember when the AIDS epidemic was coming out and I had family in medical care and there were nurses who did not want to work with people who had HIV. And that was just, they were so comfortable with that level of discrimination that they were open about talking about it. Like there wasn't anything wrong with not wanting to work with a patient for particular symptoms they might have. We've come a really long way in disability awareness and acceptance, but severe behaviors are still really leaning on the side. Additionally, we, you are protected from expulsion from school. I give you the code here to go ahead and look up. This is regarding manifestation. Your child can't be expelled from school and they also have the right to go to school till they're 21. And you have a right to community-based services, which we will be covering in just a little bit. Parental right. The 14th Amendment in the United States Constitution says that parents have a fundamental right to direct the care and upbringing and education of their children. And I, I hear this and I heard it when I was coming through, when I was first started letting everyone know we were doing the webinar and people asked specifically about their state. Of course, I can't possibly know the individual laws and policies with, within every state, but what we're gonna be discussing today is federal policy and it is blanketed above and it supersedes any of the state policies that you might have. So what we know is severe behaviors in SYNGAP-1 are involuntary as a medical symptom. Our children have protections under disability discrimination laws and the United States Constitution says that we, the parents, are the ones with the fundamental right to direct their care. So now, once upon a time, a C switched with a T and I had a magical princess. Let's introduce Jaden. She is a natural born princess super creative. We have all kinds of art projects going at the house on the regular. Compassionate and has a healer's soul. This is her baby doll. After I had brain surgery, she wanted him to take care of the baby too, like mom had her eye covered. The resident makeup artist. She has the award for the sweetest greeter in school. She's super friendly and social and she is fun and absolutely hilarious. She really loves a good knock knock joke. Jaden really was born for greatness and she knows it and you know it as soon as she walks into any room, she just has a magnetism about her that we see with many of our Singapians. Jane's 18 years old and she has a nonsense soft coat on the 13th exon of her sixth chromosome. So why not stop there? And that, that is really the dilemma that we've had with, with getting this information out again across multiple developmental disabilities is why not stop there? And if we stop there, then we will not get the research that we need we won't get the policy changes that we need. And this goes into even making sure that we adjust the curriculum as providers are coming through their coursework in college that includes information on this because a lot of providers just don't even know that this subset of the population exists. It is so stigmatized that oftentimes we hide it. Because it is a medical symptom, it isn't something we need to feel any kind of shame about. Severe behaviors don't define her, but they are a challenging symptom of SYNGAP-1 that in the absence of appropriate supports and services repeatedly resulted in life-threatening crises. What are severe behaviors? One final disclaimer before we get into them is that SYNGAP-1 is a spectrum. So your child may or may not ever have this level of behaviors, but for me, I would rather be overprepared than underprepared <laughs> as I was. And so it is my hope that if any of this happens, you at least have a toolkit now on how to navigate this to keep everybody safe. 
Severe behaviors include self-injury, aggression, elopement, property destruction. PICA also would be included in that, although we're not gonna discuss that part today. This is self-injury. Um, self-injury can include biting, head banging, hitting, scratching, gouging, picking. This is obviously Jaden's go-to is biting herself, which is done regularly, daily. Um, and this is really mild in, on the continuum of self-injury. Self-injury is the most difficult behavior to modify and it is truly the most heartbreaking. We don't have enough research yet into SYNGAP, one specific severe injury to know what, how far this really goes, but we do have plenty of information on autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability to know what the potential of injury is. I, I've spoken to two different treatment centers this, this year alone already, and they were, they had just admitted two different patients who had literally gouged out an eye during a self-injurious behavior. And so this is something that we really need more, more treatment for. We need more ways of keeping our kids safe. Aggression can be hitting, punching, kicking, pulling hair, pushing, biting, ripping clothes, spitting, scratching. So here, you know, are just a few of my minor injuries in the past um, couple months that were just, but it has gotten much worse in the past. We're in a really good place right now where we have a safety plan. And that's gonna be something that I help you guys develop. Elopement, our, our kids, we've always known that they're at risk of that. This is a picture Mike has shared in another one of the SRF presentations and, and this happened so quickly. It was just a couple minutes and she was out the door and on her bike, fortunately with her helmet on, speeding down a hill when she doesn't know how to break her bike. And so this is the result of that. Property destruction. Um, this is regular. See a candle broken on the bottom right there, flipping furniture, tossing, tossing objects and huge holes in the walls. I don't even attempt to patch them anymore. One day when she's completely stabilized, maybe then, but for now we patch them and she kicks holes in them again. Um, this is our $8,000 AAC device, which fortunately was under warranty. So we were able to get that fixed. Complications of traditional treatments. Most individual, individuals with SYNGAP1 have drug-resistant epilepsy. So our regular pharmaceutical options aren't going to work for them. SYNGAP protein plays a critical role in memory and learning. So it's very challenging to teach them adaptive skills. Limited communication means obviously that CBT and EMDR are out. Travel to specialists may be extremely dangerous if behaviors occur while the parent is driving. I have been, um, I, I have been subject to an, a, a spontaneous aggressive behavior from Jaden while I was driving down I-24, 70 miles an hour. And as I'm trying to fend her off and continue to drive with her other hand, she went to reach for her door to that the danger of her falling out of the car driving at 70 miles an hour. It was absolutely terrifying and panicked. Another time we had to contact EMS and they had to block the street off after we went to an oral surgery appointment because she didn't want to leave the dentist. She loves the doctor's office. And she went into such a behavior episode in the parking lot that we had to call EMS. And so just simple things like taking them to the doctor become a really really big challenge. Emergency department protocols are typically specific to psychiatric crises. And that is very different than developmental disorder crises. So for example, the, the images I showed you of the self-injury, that to her is a soothing thing. That's why she does that. Um, and, but yet when you have self-injury, in an emergency department, if they don't have new protocols, then they are stuck 
that they have to go through their psychiatric protocols, which means that self-injury is considered cause for a psychiatric hold and a suicidal risk evaluation. You, this means that this delays our children from being able to be stabilized and brought out of, a, of a, an environment that is very bright and very loud and very overstimulating. So the Center for Start Services has created guidelines for that. I recommend if that's something that you're interested in contacting them so that you can uh, work to get your own emergency rooms with those new protocols. There's very limited options. And I called dozens of locations looking for treatment for Jaden, whether it was acute treatment or residential treatment. Um, we knew that we were in crisis and every single one of them, um, once they got to a point where they heard about that she has lennox gastaut syndrome or especially that she has Syngap-1, they were out. Um, so the only place that was willing to accept admission was Kennedy Krieger's Neurobehavioral Unit. And it is around an 18 month average wait list. And that is just really unacceptable as a system that we can have children in such severe crises that have no options for treatment. It really is a void that we all need to address. If you'd like more options, more information on the crisis and crisis care, I actually hosted a webinar just a couple months ago with National Council on Severe Autism, and we brought in some really great speakers on this topic. They do a really good job of sharing about that, so you can look more into that there. So here is tips to prepare for this. And again, whether or not you see these behaviors yet doesn't matter. You can still do these things. They, I believe they would improve overall quality of life anyways. Um, but additionally, it's just better safe to be sorry. First thing is crisis planning. And you guys can do this today. You can start it today. It is, for me, I just use a Google Drive document so that I can easily share it between providers on the fly as I need to. It's a crisis plan. And you can come back to this. We will have the handouts. I'm not gonna read through it all. We'll have the handouts and this will be recorded. You can come back to it. Notice I also say, determine if police officers in the community have crisis intervention training. And this is really important. Uh, again, you don't want to end up in a situation where you need to call 911 and the responding officers are not trained in this and treat it as a domestic incident or a criminal assault. And so, Find out if they have it, and if they don't, you can advocate that they do. Our state, our Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disability is offering this training to any departments that would like to have it. And so that might be a place to start with your own state. Therapies to ameliorate severe behaviors. Physical therapy, occupational speech therapy, most of you probably already have these things and they were, will be things you wanna continue because physical therapy is gonna help reduce pain. Pain is oftentimes a trigger for behaviors, especially pain that they can't uh, understand nor can they communicate. Occupational therapy is huge because then we're gonna work on the sensory regulation. Speech therapy is really big, not just for speech and communication, but for cognition and I personally got to understand that after brain surgery, I couldn't do simple fourth grade math for a while. And it was actually speech therapy that helped me overcome my neurocognitive deficits. And so speech therapy really is a good tool for us to continue to help try to build those neural pathways that are so disrupted from Syngap-1. ABA therapy though takes the absolute cake. It is the heavy hitter, it'll be the keystone of all of your therapies and not just your therapies, but your other treatments that you apply for down the road because they're data monsters, right? Like these guys, <laughs> they live and breathe data and that data we can use for other treatments that we need to apply for and be able to justify medical necessity. 
ABA outcomes are the exact opposite of the earlier slide where we talked about emotional dysregulation. You know, this is where we're going to learn how to differentiate between different emotions and coping strategies uh, that our children can acquire and retain. So ABA is really making some positive pro progress with Jaden. Collaborate, don't eliminate. And for us with ABA, that really means that we understand that behavior is communication. We don't really want to stop any type of communication, do we? Especially when our children are so limited in it to begin with. But for Jaden, um, we might be seeing her aggress at us, but what does that behavior say? Somebody might think that that says if she's angry, and maybe it does, but it also for Jaden, if she really is in need of some really deep pressure and say she doesn't have unabated access to a compression vest or a weighted blanket, say she doesn't have the verbal ability to self-advocate and ask for that or doesn't have visual cards to point that out, what's a really easy way to get that pressure input is through an aggressive behavior. And that could just be one reason why she might have an, an aggressive behavior that has nothing to do with her actually being angry. And so when you work with a VCBA, they're gonna be able to help look at those antecedents and the whole context of the picture to be able to find the true functions of behavior so that you can develop true solutions for them. This is a quote by Dr. Greg Hanley. Teach them that you know them, you see them, you hear them, and you're there, there for them. This is the first and crucial step. And I really love this quote. I have just recently, in the past couple months, come on to him. This is a program that we're doing with Jaden now called My Way, and it's amazing. It's, it's working so much <laughs> more than any other ABA therapy we've had in the past. So I'm not saying it, it is the solution for your children. But if you've been trying multiple different options and they haven't worked yet, have your BCBA check this out, do their own research and see if it might be a good fit for your child. Here's some poll results. We put up a poll, we asked, 35 of you responded, how many weekly hours of ABA therapy are you getting? And overwhelmingly, we know that uh, Syncapians are getting 20, more than 20 hours a week. I'd be really interested to hear what that final number is. Like if you did answer more than 20 hours a week, if you want to put into chat how many you did end up getting. Um, there also is down here others, 6%. And that is because there was some uh, written in responses. And one of them was a concern regarding they were getting only five hours of BCBA, the other was 15 of RBT hours. And there was another uh, written in answer as well. But I wanted to give you guys this resource. And so this is the Behavior Analyst Certification Board and they actually have a certificate registry. Oh, the other, the other one was they were having, they were approved but having a hard time finding providers. And so if you go to this website, this website will, show you all about the varying credentials between an RBT, a BCABA, and a BCBA. It will let you be able to find providers in your area. And it also allows you, if you have any kind of funny feeling about your providers, or you just want to check on them, it will, you can look them up. You can make sure that their licensing is current. You can make, you can see if they have any disciplinary actions against them or any pending actions against them. And this is just a way to do a fidelity check. Now, myself personally, Jaden has just gotten the most amazing team of behavioral providers across the board. We're now into our third set since moving to this particular town. And they just all have been ethics-driven, trauma-informed people who really, um, they're just amazing at their jobs. And so I have no personal concerns with ours, but I understand that not all are created equal. 
And this is a really good resource to give you those answers. Home modifications and technology. You're not gonna be able to afford to do all of these today, <laughs> but these you can start piecemealing together, prioritize what you can do right away. Oh, that I made an Amazon shopping list. It is not affiliate links or anything like that. I'll put the link in at, at the end also. It's just so you don't have to type in everything and search for all these things. And um, this is the first thing we use. We use Lexian instead of plexiglass or other options. We use Lexian. You can get it in different thicknesses and sizes and readily available. And we just stick it on with some industrial Velcro tape. She never even knows it's there. And this is an additional layer of protection to prevent glass break, which could result in obviously injuries or falling out a window. Padded walls, these are custom padded walls that came out of her home modification budget. But if you can't do something like this and you do want to reinforce your walls, you can use Lexian again or chipboard and then get some gym mats and it'll be a temporary solution. For me, the issue isn't even the walls. Again, a property I don't care as much about. I care about her and her foot has been injured. She has nerve damage um, because of kicking the wall so much. So if you can pad those to make it a little less injurious. Smart home devices. It doesn't matter to me whether you use Alexa or Google. I, I have Alexa just because I had it, I think before Google came out. The important thing is to find something that you can voice activate your home. You are not gonna always have your phone with you, but you may need to call for help or activate another device, something from another room, some kind of device. Smart locks and door re reinforcers. We, in every single room of my house, except for her bedroom or her bathroom, I have some type of coded or fingerprinted or Bluetooth lock. And I also have these door plate reinforcers. And this is because if somebody tries to kick a door in, the door is shut in the middle of the door, but they're kicking down here and they can kick that door in from the bottom. These door plate reinforcers prevent that from happening and they are very cheap on Amazon to be able to make sure you have that extra layer of security. Home security system, again, I don't know about the other ones, they may offer discounts. I use Vivint, but they do offer a discount for families that have developmental disabilities. I particularly like that they have glass break sensors and they tell me which, if something opens a door or a window, it doesn't just give me an alarm, it tells me which one. And from brain surgery, I have single-sided deafness, so no sense of direction. So that allows me to immediately go to where I actually need to go to. It'll say master bedroom window open and I know to go to the source of the issue. Smart outlets. Prior to getting these, I was having to go into the garage at night and shut the breaker off and so that if she got up and she wouldn't turn the stove on or get try to turn the other KitchenAid mixer on. But now with smart locks, you can just deactivate outlets as you need to from your phone. So these ones you actually install. If you're not comfortable with those, you could use the plug-in kind. Um, but again, that's not gonna be as secure because the electricity is still gonna be to the outlet. And if you feel like your child would know to replug that into the actual outlet, it's better to go with these kind. Smart home cameras. So I have five and they're positioned through all areas of the, common areas of the house, no bedrooms or bathrooms. And this is how all of this works in coordination. So this is during a behavior you see here, tables flipped over, bottom right of the screen there is my bedroom door. I have backed myself into that room. And while she was coming at me, I have the plate on the bottom that I talked about. So she can't kick the door in. I have already called for crisis support at this point, but I, I have safe distance and a barrier between me and her. I'm also then watching on the cameras to make sure that she is safe. If you, I don't know if you remember in the beginning with property destruction, I showed you a broken candle. That would be a situation where I come back out of the room 
because at that point, then there's a risk to her being cut. And so that's why I need to have some, a visual of her while I'm not in there, but also keep myself safe and allow her to de-escalate out here. It has two-way audio. I can continue to try to verbally de-escalate her. And um, this is really a useful crisis situation plan that we have had. We have not had to call 911 since developing this crisis plan. Sensory regulation. I'm gonna kind of fly through these because I'm sure most of you already know this, but hypersensitive, hyposensitive, sensory avoidant, sensory seeking, right? We know to keep these tools available for our kids. These are the various senses. For Jaden in particular, proprioceptive is the biggest issue of need for input. Synaptic dysregulation that we talked about before will cause the sensory interpretation to vacillate. So your kid might this morning be um, maybe fighting themselves and really needing that, that intense tactile input and then an hour later, if you barely touch their skin, they may react as if you threw something hot on them, you know, and, and not be able to feel any even light touch. And so that is common. We deal with these rapid cycling of hypo hypersensitive uh, senses all the time. Compression vests, compression sheets, weighted blankets, weighted vests. This compression sheet, the blue one here, they are like $20, $25 on Amazon. And I don't think we were able to get her to start sleeping through the night till we bought one. I, I didn't even know that they existed for like 17 years. <laughs> so they're really great. Rice filled pads. I made this one, but they also sell them and they give a little bit of weight. So they're like, this one I think is four and a half pounds. You put them in the microwave or the freezer. So it gives that heat plus uh, the weight. She really likes them, finds them calming. Visual charts and giving them options, right? Allowing them to self-advocate and self-soothe. So she wears this around her neck on, on the left here. She wears just a necklace that have various options of what she might need right now. Maybe she needs a hug, maybe she wants to read a book, whatever it might be, but these are various adaptive strategies for mood regulation that she knows about. And she can just flip through them and look through them herself without us needing to verbally prompt her. This is her sensory room, or not sensory room. It's just kind of Jaden's area downstairs. And this is where we have for her to go calm down or just watch her tablet, whatever she wants to use it for. And you see she has different options of how she might be feeling. And she compare that with on the right hand side, what can we do with those feelings? So oral chewies, if you guys are a fan or if you haven't tried them before, I reached out to ARC and they gave us a discount code for you guys. It's SRF webinar one, and it'll be available until April 15th. So these are a couple of Jaden's favorites. They're super fun. And she likes going through the catalog with me and telling me she really wants all of them, but, um, but again, you know, holes in the wall. So, so Oral Chewies, an arc therapeutic. Noise canceling headphones, we very familiar with those. You'll have this in the handouts, lots of different options for proprioceptive activities. We use a lot of things like baking. We have a 30 pound medicine ball, vacuuming. A lot of your household chores will give that input as well. Tactile activities. Shaving cream is probably one of her favorites. It's a dollar at the Dollar Tree and just spread it on the table and let them have fun. Scorpions love to have um, baths and swimming and water play. And that's another really useful option. So acquiring benefits. EPSDT, this is probably the one I get asked the most about and it is the most important one. Early and periodic screening, diagnostic and treatment services. So why such a mouthful is because it wasn't actually, it's own law. This is a section written into the Social Security Act with a lot of teeth. And EPSDT, the goal of it is the right care to the right child at the right time in the right setting. If your child 
is under 21, if they have Medicaid, CHIP, the HCBS waiver, or the Katie Beckett waiver, parts A or C, part, part B doesn't, doesn't qualify, then yes, they do have protections under EPSDT. You don't need to have a card for it or a letter saying that you're eligible. It's again, it's not its own separate entity. It just automatically blankets over top of these insurances. If you're a provider watching today, I went ahead and made this flow chart. Keep it with you so that you can kind of navigate through. I get asked a lot is, you know, I've got this new patient. Do you think that maybe they would apply for it or qualify for it? This is the roadmap to EPSDT eligibility. ABA therapy caps, some states have them, some don't. We talked about the importance of it. We talked about the enormous amount that our children have and have a need for, but yet there's these caps and some are based on finances, some are based on age. These will not match up for what our kids' needs are. If you look, some of these age limits, Utah is age limit of 10. I, that's, that's incredible to me. Jaden didn't even have this level of behavior really turn on until she was 15. We always had behavior issues, but not anything crisis support. So we wouldn't have even known yet the intensity of services we needed at, at some of these young ages. But with EPSDT, a state's normal caps on services, even whether they normally offer them or not, doesn't matter. The only thing that matters at that point is medical necessity. So this is really a big deal. Medical necessity recommendations. This is for providers. This is something you can print out and give to them. This is the, the recommendations I have just from experience of going through this of what should be included in that original order. You don't need a special form for it. Your doctor's just gonna write the order just the same way they would any other time, but include this, these extra details to try to prevent uh, any kind of denials and delaying the care that you might need. This doesn't have to go to a special department. It just automatically, everything is the same. It automatically goes through if they can prove medical necessity. But what if you are denied? The only reason you should be denied is that the MCO, the managed care organization or Medicaid administrator, straighter, doesn't feel that you met medical necessity limits. So you still need to prove medical necessity and you have a few ways to do that. You can do peer to peer review, which is you know, your doctor's office calls the insurance company and they can just have a conversation. A lot of times that is how it's resolved, just finding out maybe they're missing some piece of the information. You can do an appeal if you're within your time limit. Usually it's 60 days, we'll check your letter. And then if that's denied, you also can ask for administrative hearing. And that will go before a judge who very much will be able to look at all the pieces of the case and he will understand, or she will understand EPSDT. What if you're approved, but no providers available? This is the land we sat in for a really long time because I myself didn't know about EPSDT either or some of the other things we're gonna be talking about. State Medicaid agencies have a responsibility to maintain an adequate provider network. So you can ask them to request a provider search. You can also start to contact providers yourself and ask them if they can do it, if they can't, then you can ask them, do they have a recommendation, a phone number for you to call somebody else who might? You can ask them if they would do a single case agreement. Just try not to get off the phone <laughs> until you get one little piece for the next call. A single case agreement means they don't have to be in network, but they're willing to work with your insurance company just for your case. If they agree to that and your insurance company agrees to that, you've got, you've got a provider, even though it's out of network. Um, and also would an out-of-state out of telehealth service work for you? That's another way we found services. Workforce crises are due in large part to 
an inadequate compensation for these providers. So advocate with your legislators. We, this, this is something we all should be doing, whether our children have severe behaviors or not, we all need access to these services. And this is just a really unpaid, underpaid profession. And so we are working on some legislation here in Tennessee. They, they have begun to increase wages for direct service providers, but it's, it's a beginning step. There are many more things we could be doing and really big deal. Advocate with your legislators. Let's get our providers paid. Many providers don't even understand that this is going on. And what I was talking about earlier, that this isn't even part of their curriculum most times as they're coming through their coursework. So tell your story. Whatever is going on for your particular syncopian, research it, find out about it, become the expert on your child and start telling your story because there might be other providers that resonate with that. And who knows, it might become the absolute passion. Jaden's had providers who, after they've left her case, they've actually joined in with the Council on Developmental Disabilities and begun advocating on particular issues that they saw while they were providing care for her, issues within the system that they decided they wanna change then. So tell your story. And when all else fails, but most likely before, Partner with other organizations and disability groups. And for myself, I, as uh, Olga said in the beginning, I sit on a couple of committees for the National Council on Severe Autism. And I also am a scholar with the Council on Developmental Disabilities, their partners in policymaking class. There's a disability coalition arc. There's all kinds of different options and no, these aren't specific SYNGAP1 organizations, but these, are, these, these organizations are fighting for change in policy in topics that do affect our SYNGAPians. So absolutely find whichever ones you like and just start getting involved, join email lists. Question is, did you know about EPSDT? So state Medicaid agencies are required to inform all Medicaid eligible individuals under 21 that EPSDP services are available. But yet, I don't know that I've ever really started talking about this where people are like, yeah, I know about that. Everybody says, what is that? I've never heard of it. And I don't really know why that is, but yeah. Since the agencies are not telling people Let's work with these disability organizations and start to develop some awareness campaigns to make sure other parents know, because we need to have informed parents if we're gonna be driving informed care. Treatment settings and choices, the last section here. So the cost of care is really high for our children and they need a lot of supports. So we have a variety of different options. I do not judge any parent who has made any of these choices. Uh, we all have to make one of them, right? But any parent that has chosen a different choice than I make, I fully support them in their decision. I want to give you what these options are so that you can look into them. This is a primer. You won't know everything about them when we're done. But these come out of waiver services and what we were talking about before, but um, not just waiver services. This is the long-term supportive care options. When you are talking with your Medicaid administrators or your legislators regarding these services or any others, and you start to hear any kind of pushback about funding, because they will tell you that funding is the issue. The federal government has put their money where their mouth is with FMAP, Federal Medicaid Medical Assistance Package, or percentage, I'm sorry. And right now, especially with the American Rescue Plan Act, it is really high. And so for Tennessee, every dollar that is actually spent on Jaden's care, Tennessee only has to spend 18 cents of that. And the rest of that is coming from the federal government. And so the money is there, but 
legislators, a lot of times, they don't even know about this stuff. It's not that they don't care. They don't know because none of us can possibly know everything about every topic. You might have a senator who was a car dealer, owned a car dealership, or you know, a, another that was a farmer and another that might be a pharmacist. So they know what their niches are or what committees they sit in, but make sure you know it. Know how the money's coming, know what your numbers are, research this within your own state so that you can be informed when you go to advocate for certain things, you do have the accurate data when you're talking to them. The first model for long-term supportive services is home and community-based services, just referred to as HCBS commonly. This is the particular model that I have chosen for Jaden. Again, that doesn't make my decision any better or, or worse than anybody else's. In this particular model, this means that she stays home with me and that I assume some of the burden of care for her. I don't receive 24 seven supports that she might receive in some of the other options, but I do receive supports out of, the, out of HCBS. And this can include a lot of different things, such as the home modifications that I talked about with the mats on her wall, uh, community integration supports, independent living skills training. So this is the one that we chose. Some of these programs have parent caregiver pay. I get asked that a lot too, but most of them don't. So just don't even really worry too much about parent caregiver pay. It's just not something that is widely done. You can find out your own state waivers list at medicaid.gov. I don't know why that some places, some states switch these words, these words and acronyms around. So sometimes it's called community living supports and sometimes it's called supported community living, but it's the same thing either way. But this is where we're talking about group homes and the group home still is under the HCBS, but one is staffed with employees that come through every shift, you know, and the other is a CLS family model home that's not staffed with changing shift staff. Instead, it's not foster care because your child's not under the state's care. Uh, but that's the best example I have to give of it where a family that is trained is caring for that particular individual, not a revolving staff. And so that's a CLS family model. When I went to my last surgery in uh, November, this is the respite model we used for Jaden. She stayed with a nurse who could provide her daily skilled nursing services. And she stayed there for the week that I was gone in Boston. Facility-based care. There are a variety of facility-based care. It's important to note, once you go into this side of it, even if you have the waiver, you will lose the waiver. Um, you, you may be able to get it back after you come out, but you can't have both. So psychiatric residential treatment facility is a PRTF. They are 24 seven. They're a non-hospital secure facility though, but there are tons of therapies available on site. The, the downside is I would just say, do your research. There are good ones and helpful ones. And then there are really dangerous ones, truly. So do your research with whatever option you have. And it's important to note, the reason I don't judge parents for however they decide is because abuse and neglect can happen under any setting, including parent homes, including if the child is, stays with their family, right? That none of these settings are better than another or more at risk or adverse than the other. But it's important just to make sure we're, we're doing our research. Lake Mary PRTF in Kansas is one that has been recommended to me many times by some professionals I know in the community. And so that was the one that I put just as an example here for you guys to check out. Neurobehavioral units, these are specialized. These are the cream of the crop when it comes into if you really need to treat and, and stabilize a major crisis that is ongoing. This is what you're gonna be looking for for somebody who is medically complex like our children are and have neurological disorders and possibly other physical conditions with these aggressive and self-injurious behaviors. This is, uh, and Kennedy Krieger, 
is the example of that there. Intermediate care facilities, and these are otherwise known as ICFs. These are considered the most comprehensive benefit in Medicaid, and they are usually around eight to 15, but there's really not a definitive guidance on, on what they need to be. What these are is the most frequently inspected. These are the most regulated out of the options and they have day programs and that might be vocational or it might be recreational, but the states cannot limit your access to an ICF or an, I, an ICF. And this is something that I do hear as an issue coming up repeatedly through the advocacy circuit is parents are being told, you know, they, they feel that an ICF might be the best for their child who has a high level of support they don't feel that they personally can manage the behaviors at home anymore on their own. They don't feel like a group home would be a high enough level of support and they want their child to be in an ICF. And yet they're being told by MCOs that ICFs are all bad or they, they've shut them all down or I hear a lot of different things, but the law is that they may not limit your access to an ICF or make it subject to waiting lists, but they are doing that as well. Not waiting lists, what they're doing is they're housing individuals for months on end in ERs with nowhere to go because we have shut down many of these ICFs. There's very limited numbers of them left in the country. And so we have children who are teenagers and under months on end who have severe challenging behaviors, neurocognitive issues, and they are sitting in an ER room. So that is why this is such an important topic that we cannot afford any longer not to talk about. This is the expenditures on HCBS. And this is kind of gonna give you, this is actually an older, this is from 2019, I couldn't find a more recent one, but I would actually say, this has changed a little bit, I know specifically for Tennessee, but this will give you an idea of how difficult or hard it might be in your state. If you do get to a point you feel that an ICF is, is a factor, it's gonna be really hard in states that are green here. Um, they are very anti uh, all ICFs. Uh, they, don't, they don't feel that there is a reason for it, even though they do still have to provide it. And, um, but if you have a state where you're in the light blue, you're gonna have a really difficult time most likely getting HCBS services. And this is kind of the problem we see, right? Because none of our kids are the same and none of the parents' situations are the same. And what's really important is that we have choice and that we're able to individualize the treatment options per each child's choice. And that choice comes out of Olmstead. So in Olmstead, in 1999 is a court case and it came from Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson. These two have become like my life heroes because everything that I do today really stems from this case. These are two women who were in Georgia and they needed, uh, they needed psychiatric treatment and checked, voluntarily checked themselves into the hospital. They were stabilized and they went home. And at home, they didn't have the care that they needed so they had to check themselves back into the hospital. They were stabilized and they went home. So this went on until they ended up having to stay at the hospital for years. Their providers didn't feel they needed to be there. Their providers felt that they would be able to function in the community and at home if they just had the supports that they needed, but they couldn't find them. They couldn't get the supports they needed. So the only place for them to get the care was to reside in the psychiatric hospital. And the United States Supreme Court issued that this was a violation of their Title II. That um, it was a discrimination to force them to reside solely with other disabled individuals. And it is segregation. So if your choice is to keep your children at home or into one of the community group homes, then this is really important information for you here, where people with disabilities must receive the least restrictive, most integrated setting appropriate to their needs. 
right? You cannot be forced to have your child go to an ICF. I personally just fought this battle with my own state that Jaden's choice is very clear. She wants home and she wants mom. She doesn't communicate a whole lot to us, but she is very clear about those things. So I do not want Jaden where any uh, anywhere else. Therefore, I fought to make sure she has the services at home. I did use Olmstead as the argument for that, as well as used EPSDT to cover the benefits of the level of service we need. It is unusual to have the level of services that we have. We have 112 hours a week of ABA, in addition to 56 hours a week of CNA care, in-home OTPT in speech, but that's because we have a child, well, now an adult young woman, who spent four years in crisis allowing these behaviors to exasperate to the point where she required hospitalization and none was available. So now we need a really intensive facility level care to be provided for her. And that's being done in the home. And that's her choice of setting until we can stabilize her. So being forced to live solely with other disabled individuals, as I said, that is described, that is defined as segregation in Olmstead. If your choice is to keep your children at home, if someone is in a facility or at risk of being placed in one because of lack of services or providers, which was the case with my daughter for so many years, that is a violation of Olmstead. That person is being forced into segregation. That is wrong and someone must be held responsible. And that's from Disability Rights North Carolina. When your choice is facility care, and we're wrapping up here in just a minute, we emphasize that nothing in the ADA or its implementing regulations condones termination of institutional settings for persons unable to handle or benefit from community settings. This is straight from the original Olmstead decision. They are not condoning that we close these institutions, nor is there any federal requirement that the community-based treatment be imposed on patients who do not desire it. Olmstead very clearly intended choice. It would be unreasonable, and this is Justice Kennedy's quote during his concurring opinion of Olmstead, it would be unreasonable, it would be a tragic event, then were the American with Disabilities Act of 1990 to be interpreted so that states had some incentive for fear of litigation to drive those in need of medical care and treatment out of appropriate care and into settings with too little assistance and supervision. And so clearly was not the intent of the justices to make the pendulum sh shift to one side or the other. They believed that we should have choice of setting. So the choice is yours. Because the 14th Amendment protects your right to direct the care for your child, and Olmstead protects the right of choice of setting, and EPSTT is there to ensure that funding is available to meet the medically necessary services. And that's kind of all I got for you guys today. There's a reference page I will put on the, I'll give Olga the handouts so you guys have those. And this is the result of the services. Jaden has been isolated for a couple of years now without appropriate supports. And now this is what it looks like. We're doing outings again. We have tons of help. We have multiple behavior staff and uh, a CNA with us when we go out. And she's getting to go to the store and the parks. And we're really getting back to some normal life now that we got the services. So I hope something in here has helped you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Jackie. That was wonderful. Absolutely incredible information. Um, we're going to move on to the questions and answers. Um, we have a few here. And let's see. I have a question that's just come to mind on the ABA and I see the state limits. Um, is that something that's state limit for insurance or is that outside of the federal legislation? <laughs> um, excuse me, let me pull up, pull back here, the reference list. I'll pull it up for you. 
what was the reference list number on that? Um, you had some numbers, some limitations for on different Autism states. Autism and insurance states, actually national, is that what it was? Yeah, I didn't know if. if yeah. Um, that's hard and fast. And yeah. A question you can answer uh, pertaining to if you were able to obtain additional benefits through the federal. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, if, if you were able to um, obtain additional hours outside of the state, what the state yes. mandates. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So that's absolutely. Just for yes, insurance. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter what their, what their, what their limits um, are. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, what, what matters is what, so the, I lost our, I have so many different um, pictures up. There you guys are. <laughs> and so what matters is, is it allowable under federal Medicaid? So for example, experimental drug treatments aren't something that federal Medicaid covers, but federal Medicaid doesn't have caps on ABA. Okay. So that's where if it's something that federal Medicaid covers, it doesn't matter what the state limitations are. We normally do give states the options to set whatever limits they want, determine which services they're going to cover or not, and how they're going to spend those dollars. But with EPSDT, it, it falls back into federal okay. category. Okay, good. That, that's it. Okay, uh, we have one question uh, asking about how do you get insurance to approve ABA, and they're referring to 10 care, which... Oh. Well, 10 care is my gig. So um, go ahead and give me, uh, you can reach me on the Facebook, what we need yesterday. And I can help you kind of work through that specifically. But with 10 care, you need, do need to use an autism diagnosis code with that. Um, I would also use SYNGEP1 as the secondary. Mike, Mike and I actually were just talking about that before the thing today. And then, you're going to just need to prove medical necessity. And it really should not be hard with what we know about SYNGAP1. Um, you're gonna list any kind of issues you might be having with these particular behaviors that I showed you today. Make sure that you can try to track intensity, duration, frequency. It doesn't have to be perfect. Keep a tally sheet at home. And over you know, one, two days, just start marking down how many times did you see these particular things? Was it a lot? And start giving this to your providers to say, look, here's, here's what I'm, I'm experiencing at home and I need some help in here. They'll order an evaluation. And once the BCBA comes out to do an assessment, the BCBA will be who submits the treatment plan for how many hours that you're requesting. And we have somebody asking if you had to choose between CLS and CLS FM, which would you choose and why? CLS. Okay. Um, I am. Uh, I I just am so cynical. I want to make sure there's as many eyeballs on my daughter as possible, and I feel like. If somebody is just there by themselves, then that leaves a lot more opportunity for, uh, for things to occur without there being that accountability. Whereas if you have staff coming in and out, although you are dealing with staff turnover and things like that, um, I think it would give her continuity of a relationship more if she was in a family model home. But uh, I just feel for safety purposes, I would probably go CLS, but yeah, yeah. Hard, hard, hard decisions all around. Yeah. And also uh, they're asking about the law similar to Olmstead that applies to schools. Okay, students being forced into special day schools because they are in crisis at the schools of zone without adequate supports. So in the beginning, <clears throat> um, I posted the manifestation law on there. So the schools cannot remove your child for any longer than 45 days. They, they can do 10 days initially um, and they can do up to 45 days. But if you can prove that these behaviors that, that, that became the issue are a source of, a dis, of the disability is the source of those behaviors, then they have just those 45 days to figure out how they're gonna manage it. Right. So my suggestion would be 
if you've gotten to that point where you're already in a day program, I'd certainly contact your disability rights network in your state or step or ARC or someone that has disability education advocates available, sometimes called disability education mentors now. Uh, find one of them to work and partner with you, but you wanna have a functional behavior analysis with school. You wanna have a behavior intervention plan attached to your IEP, and you wanna make sure that you understand their rights under manifestation. And um, the final question is walking us through the process for requesting services through PE, EPSDT. Would that be disability rights or would that be a different? Requesting services? Through, through the EPSDT where the state is not fulfilling. Oh, if they're not, yeah. um, then contact one of the justice centers with your state or yes, you can. I, I think maybe disability rights in North Carolina has picked up a couple cases. Some states, their disability rights network is kind of focusing on education or focusing on the seclusion issue and segregation issue surrounding Olmstead. Um, but yeah, I would contact either your justice center or your disability rights network. There is a lot of phone calls when, when you're advocating and Many of them are not fruitful, and many of them kind of send you on what feels like a wild goose chase, but just keep calling from one to the next until you find that person that will help and take that, that on. But yes, uh, EPSDT, if you feel you're covered and they're giving you caps or denials, fight that, fight it hard. I know, I know what it's like to be there. I was there a while. And uh, we have Teresa asking if any additional supports for adults over and beyond HCBS or family CILA. So that, that is uh, not my niche yet. Um, and it is terrifying to me because EPSDP only covers till 21. The day she turns 21, she falls off a cliff of services. She no longer has this blanket of protection. And it took us so long just to even know that it existed. So, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I wanted to share this today. So you can get as many services as you can while you can get them. But after 21, you do keep HCBS. In fact, actually, HCBS services, depending on your state, may even increase once you're 21. Um, but yeah, you lose H, you lose HCBS, or I'm sorry, you lose EPSDT, but you do keep HCBS if you have that. Thank you, Jackie. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this finalizes our presentation for today. It's a wonderful, um, wonderful amount of research on your behalf, and we really appreciate you doing this for SRF today. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Thank you.